Right guys, in this video we are going to be looking at social and psychological explanations for obedience. Now depending on what book you're using, this also is sometimes called situational variables, but that can get a little bit confusing because there's also another lesson that's called situational variables, which is totally different. So we're going to go with social and psychological explanations, and it's going to include the agentic state and the legitimacy of authority. We're going to start off with the legitimacy of authority and then move on to the agentic state about halfway through the video, just because it makes sense to do it that way. And I'll do a quick summary after each one because there's a fair amount of content in each of them. If you want to skip to a particular bit of the video, then you can use the chapters in the description below. And if you're after some exam questions to practice your exam technique, I'll link a social influence exam playlist at the top of your screen now. Just keep in mind that it is a playlist that is gonna get added to all the time. So remember to keep an eye out for when new questions go live. And then before we get started, as always, if you find the video useful, please let me know by giving it a like. So, social psychological explanations are all about our interactions with others, rather than external factors in the situation. Okay, so in the last video we looked at situational variables, which was like uniform, proximity, location, that kind of thing. All of these things are external, whereas this is all about how we interact with other people. Two specific explanations that we're going to be looking at that I mentioned earlier are the legitimacy of authority, and the agentic state, both of which look at the dynamics surrounding social hierarchies and how these dynamics can lead to obedience in any given situation. The legitimacy of authority is an explanation for obedience that says we are more likely to obey people who we perceive to be above us in the social hierarchy. Okay, notice how I said perceive, they don't have to necessarily be above us, but we have to feel like they are. Okay, most societies and structures within those societies are laid out in a hierarchical way, in that there is generally someone who is in charge or somebody who we feel like is in charge. That can be businesses, families, schools, friendship groups, or just social situations. There is usually a pecking order of some kind. We are raised from childhood to be aware of and to appreciate that some people are in certain positions and therefore hold more authority over us than other people do. Okay, And then authority in any given situation is made known to us through things like a uniform. Okay, so if somebody walks in with a uniform on and it is a specific situation, then that uniform might convey that that person is an authority figure. Okay, so that could be a suit, it could be a police officer who's wearing their police uniform, it could be something as simple as a high-vis vest. Okay, something that suggests that person is in control in that situation. Who has what level of authority in any given situation is generally agreed on by society, okay? And as a society, we allow certain people to exercise some social power over us in order for society to run smoothly. So in effect, we are giving up some of our independence and we're allowing other people to make the rules which we then follow because otherwise society would be carnage. Okay, And this is something that we learn, like I said earlier, in childhood, and it's reinforced through the process of socialization. Okay, So it's like when your parents say things like, listen to the policeman, or do what your teacher says. Or when you get a little bit older, and you know not to annoy the bouncer in the club, because they'll chuck you out if you do. Now, when it works, it's great. But... When it goes wrong, and when authority started to be used in a negative way, it can all go very, very badly. Okay, and that's something that we saw in Milgram's research, where people were willing to act in a destructive way and cause harm to others just because a legitimate authority figure gives them an order to do so. And what we saw in Milgram's research is only a small example of how things can go very, very badly. There are plenty of real-world examples of when leaders, legitimate authority figures, have used their power for destructive purposes. 
which is known as destructive authority. Okay, so go back through the history books and take your pick of Hitler or Stalin or Idi Amin or Pol Pot or Kim Jong Un or whoever else. You know, there are loads and loads of destructive authority figures out there, whether those are old or new, that are using their authority in a negative way. Okay, so that is the legitimacy of authority. And that was the first little section. I've got it summarized for you here so that you can see what the important bits are. The exam practice video that I mentioned earlier will go through some example questions for you and will show you how to formulate answers. So like I said at the start, if that's something that you want to do, the link is in the description below and it will also pop up at the end. So moving on to the second part now, the agentic state is a mental state where we feel no personal responsibility for our behavior because we believe that we're acting on behalf of an authority figure, okay? We are acting as their agent. Being in this state frees us from the demands of our conscience and it allows us to obey even when the actions would generally go against our morals or our values. Okay. Interestingly, when people are in the agentic state, they are able to act against their conscience, but they still know what they're doing is wrong, so they still feel a certain degree of anxiety or guilt, or whatever you want to call it, over what they're doing. They just feel powerless to disobey. The opposite of an agentic state is called the autonomous state. The autonomous state is where you are free to act according to your own principles, according to your own morals and values. When you're in the autonomous state, you feel responsible for your actions because you feel in control of what you're doing. Okay, you're no longer acting on behalf of somebody else. You're doing what you want to do. The process of moving from an autonomous state to an agentic state is known as the agentic shift. Now, Milgram suggested that this shift happens when we're in the presence of someone that we perceive to be a legitimate authority figure, somebody that is high up in the social hierarchy. And then when somebody like that is present, others in the group generally defer decisions and actions to that person, which then results in the agentic shift. Okay, so it results in moving from an autonomous state to the agentic state. Okay, so if you remember right at the beginning of the video, I said that it makes sense to start with the legitimacy of authority. That is because you need a legitimate authority figure to be present in order for an agentic shift to actually take place. Okay, you can't have an agentic state without the presence of a legitimate authority figure. Now, an interesting thing that was observed by Milgram during his study is that many of his participants actually wanted to stop, but they didn't feel like they could. Okay, so they felt powerless, for want of a better phrase, to say no and to stop the study. So that then begs the question why people stay in an agentic state and obey destructive authority when they actually don't want to. And the reason that Milgram came up with is something known as binding factors. Okay, so binding factors are aspects of the situation that you're in that allow people to ignore or minimize the damage that they're actually causing which then reduces the moral strain that they might be experiencing. Examples include things like victim blaming. So participants in Milgram's study might make themselves feel better by reminding themselves that the learner volunteered to be part of the study, and so they knew what they were getting into. They might use things like denial, which is telling yourself that the damage that you're causing is probably not that bad, or even that you're causing no damage at all because you can't see it. Again, in Milgram's study, there was a wall between the teacher and the learner, so you can't actually see the damage that you're causing, making it easy to be in this state of denial. People also shift responsibility, which is when you tell yourself that you don't actually want to do this and that, you know, this isn't your choice and therefore you're not the bad person. It's all somebody else's fault. Um, there are also other types of binding factors as well, such as anxiety. It's not technically part of the situation, but it is something that people experience. So the fear of consequences is also something that could keep you in an agentic state. So what would happen if I stopped obeying? Okay. So that is the agentic state. Again, here is a brief summary slide so that you can see all the important information in one place. I didn't say this earlier, but 
I'll say it now and it kind of applies. This is the information that you would technically put into an outline. Obviously, depending on how many marks your outline is worth, you may want to cut some of the information out or even add in some detail. But in a nutshell, this is what you are aiming for in a three mark, two mark, four mark, six mark outline. Okay, again, check the exam video linked in the description to see some examples of that so that you can see how it would all come together. So just before we move on to the evaluation points, just keep in mind that although these are two separate explanations for obedience, they can be assessed separately as well. They do ultimately work together because the first condition needed for an agentic shift is the perception of a legitimate authority figure. No legitimate authority figure, no agentic shift. So if you ever get an essay or any kind of question where you're talking about both of these things together, make sure that you make it clear that the two work together. It doesn't have to be much, just a sentence or so will do the trick, but it's really nice to actually point that out. Okay, so now that we've covered all of the outline, and it was a lot, I'm aware, we are going to have a quick look at the evaluation points. Unfortunately, you could get asked about both of these explanations individually, which means that you are going to need evaluation points for each. I would suggest two for each, simply because that sets you up nicely for an eight-mark essay on either of them, and so that is what we are going to do. So we'll start off with some research support, which comes from Milgram's own research. As a general rule in Milgram's research, participants would stop during the experiment and would ask questions about the procedure, checking whether the learner would be all right and asking who would be responsible if the learner was harmed, that kind of thing. After the participants were told by the experimenter that he is the one who would be responsible for any harm rather than the teacher, they quickly continued with the experiment without any further objections. Okay, so that shows that once the participants perceived they were no longer responsible for the harm that they were causing, they acted more easily as the experimenter's agent and were more willing to potentially be destructive in their actions. However, a limitation of the agentic state is that it is not supported by real-world events. For example, Mandel in 1998 described how members of a German reserve battalion murdered civilians without being directly ordered to do so. They were given a choice, and because they chose to do it, they were acting autonomously. Okay, so that suggests that there are possible other reasons, such as hatred or prejudice, racism, or even greed, that potentially played a role in their actions. And that suggests that Milgram's explanation of the agentic state is fairly oversimplified because it claims that behavior is a result of a single factor, which is acting as the agent of a destructive authority figure, when actually there are probably a lot of other factors that play in to destructive actions. Now, moving on to the legitimacy of authority, support for it comes from Tarno from 2000, who studied aviation accidents where flight crew actions were a significant factor. Now, Tarno found excessive dependence on the captain's authority and expertise in the majority of the cases. So, for example, one second officer claimed that although he noticed the captain taking a particularly risky approach, he said nothing because he assumed that the captain must know what he's doing. So such events and such recordings offer support for the impact of the presence of a legitimate authority figure and overall increases the credibility of the theory. Okay, and then finally we have a limitation of both explanations and that is that they both cannot account for instances of disobedience even in the presence of a legitimate authority figure. So, for example, Rankin Jacobson in 1977 found that 16 out of 18 nurses disobeyed an order from a doctor to administer an excessive drug dose to a patient. The doctor was an obvious authority figure, but almost all of the nurses remained autonomous. Okay, And then in Milgram's research, a significant minority of the participants also disobeyed despite recognizing the authority of the experimenter. Okay, so again, there was a legitimate authority figure present, however, a lot of them disobeyed. Okay, so findings like that suggest two things. Number one, 
The explanations can only account for some situations of obedience and are incomplete. And number two, it also suggests that some people might simply be more or less obedient than others. And that might have something to do with their locus of control, for example, which is something that we'll cover in the next lesson if you don't know what that is. Okay. And it's possible, therefore, that these innate factors have a greater influence on us than either of the explanations that we've covered in this video. Okay. Now, keep in mind that you can split this evaluation point and just use it for either the agentic state or the legitimacy of authority if you're evaluating one or the other, for example, in an eight marker or something like that. However, if you are evaluating both, then it makes sense to use them together because it makes for a nice chunky evaluation point to finish off an essay. Okay, so it'll be a nice little way to just round everything off. Right, and that brings us to the end of the video. I hope it's been useful and I hope it's all made sense. Please don't forget to check out the exam playlist for social influence, which is on your screen now and also linked in the description section below so that you can start practicing your exam technique if you haven't started doing so already. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.